Today on Extra Credit, we're traveling to Eatonville, Florida, the home of one of the greatest writers of all time, plus a Detroit artist inspired by comics. Stay tuned. and I'm glad you're with us today. Welcome to Extra Credit, where we meet interesting people, explore new ideas, and discover fun places together. Each episode, we'll introduce you to people who make the world an interesting place by using math, science, sports, writing, and the arts. Our theme today is Across America, but before we discover the beauty of our great country, I have someone I want you to meet. Hi friends, my name is Saryu. It's so great to meet you. We're kicking off by visiting Zora Neale Hurston's hometown. Miss Hurston is one of the greatest American authors of all time. Let's learn about how her hometown of Eatonville, Florida influenced her work. Zora Neale Hurston was a quintessential charismatic maverick. She's really raw. She's different from everybody else. This is the greatest thing I hear. Yeah, I heard about Eatonville. I know Zora. Zora's from Eatonville! Oh my gosh! At one point, she was the most prolific and well-read African-American woman of her time. I think she's underrated, if anything, still. Well, you know, she was born in Alabama, Notasolga, Alabama, and her father moved the family when Hurston was very young. God knows what her family went through just moving, not knowing if they were going to be stopped, if they end up her dad being lynched. But they made it here in the atmosphere that was totally black. Everyone looked like her. So I think it set the atmosphere for her to just think, dream, and write. She grew up in Eatonville, which is the oldest incorporated all-black township in the United States, and she wrote, she wrote the story of Eatonville. Eatonville is so much a part of her cultural and literary narrative. She was a modernist, a realist. She was trying to capture the authentic life of the people. She really wanted people to know what an amazing and valuable and vibrant culture she came from, and I think she did that. She wrote Their Eyes Are Watching God very quickly. She wrote it after a romantic experience with a younger man. It is a book about African-American people and within their own community, and I think she's one of the earliest writers in America to really do that. It is a tragedy of a love story. Janie is born in Alabama. She comes to Eatonville with her family. Her grandmother uh, arranges a marriage with someone who treats her like a mule. She leaves him for a, another man who is like the founder of the town of Eatonville, and he dies. And then she ends up with a kind of a, a drifter type of guy. Uh, they are caught in the hurricane, the great hurricane of the late 1920s, and uh, he is bit by a rabid dog. Uh, she has to kill him. She goes to trial. The white jury acquits her, and so she tells her story to her good companion, Phoebe. It's not only a great story, but it, it's the language and the style that really makes it a great work of American literature. Anyone who works with words, you know, you, you respect the craft the craft that her writing represents in their eyes were watching God. Here was peace. She pulled in her horizon like a great fishnet, pulled it from around the waist of the world, and draped it over her shoulder. So much of life in its meshes. She called in her soul to come and see. What she does with narrative is really interesting. Her characters are fascinating. I mean, it's a fun read. The dialect is challenging for people. She was not afraid to delve into the dialect. 
But understanding the time period, African Americans, Negroes, colored people, did not want to be identified with dialect because white people said that dialect was just an indication of just how backward you people were. There were some members of the African American community who wanted to show that works of literature were on the same par as other great modernists, and they felt that dialect was a reversion to the past. So there were people, Richard Wright, sort of notoriously and famously among them, who felt that she was kowtowing and pandering to whites, and she thought they were just angry and writing about the same thing over and over again. And I think history's kind of borne her out, right? I think she needs to be ranked among the great American literary authors, including Hemingway, Fitzgerald. I think she's, she's up there with them. She is definitely a global icon. You know, she really, she just would not give up. She's named in our hearts. She's named in the minds of the people of Eatonville. And when nobody can't say anything else, you can hear a kid say, well, Zora from here. And I think that is royally rich that her character allow it to be better than silver and gold. Now it's time to hear from our friend, Dr. Blotch, who calls in every show to demand new and creative stories from us. Wait, what? This just in, there's more than one Dr. Blotch? Oh no, this can't be good. I've heard we'll find out more as we learn about this week's challenge, which involves creating menus with tempting descriptions. Welcome back to 826 Michigan's online writing challenge. So <clears throat> Morgan, you mean Dr. Blotch's writing challenge. Blotch's writing challenge. Oh, um, Dr. Blotch, you're back. Hello. No, Morgan, that was Dr. C. Blotch who issued last week's writing challenge. We are their sucking cousins, Drs. A. and L. Blotch. Twins! Yes, there are two of us. We are identical twins with opposite personalities. Oh, um, wait, there, there's more than one blotch? More than one? <laughs> there are dozens, hundreds of us in the blotch family, all of doctors, all blotches, all 100% genius. And we, Murgatroyd, are twin blotches. But we're getting off topic. Do you hear that noise? Yes, yes, Margin, that terrible noise. Um, maybe? Is there, is there a train going by right now? Is your cat eating celery again? Um, I kind, it's like a crunching and a gurgling. And that is the entire reason we call the Majin. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's Megan, Dr. Blotch. Tomato, potato, whatever. Anyway, that is entirely the reason I called Meg Tato. I'm starving. The whole social distance thing is deeply upsetting to me because I can't visit my favorite restaurant here in Antarctica, the Pius Polenta Palace. Meanwhile at home, we're having a terrible time trying to agree on what to cook. You see, I, Dr. A. Blotch, love all things sweet, sour, salty, slimy, viscous, bubbly, hot, and gray. And I, Dr. A. Blotch, love all things cold, fuzzy, colorful, mushy, and bitter. Oh, um, well, Dr. Blotch, have you, um, have you tried breakfast for dinner? Because then you can have hot foods, like hot oatmeal and cold cereal. You could have hot chocolate and... Um, cold chocolate milk, you could have... Of course we did, Megan. We already okay. cooked our way through all of our cookbooks, including The Complete Twice Bird Cooking for Two, and The Joy of Cooking with Mow than Spores. We're out of ideas. That's why we need you, Mergen. This week we need you and all the 826 people, staff, volunteers, adoring fans, parents and guardians, and yes, even the children to bring brand new menus for us that will appeal to our eclectic, meaning very unique and different tastes. Oh, um, Dr. Splotch, I think, I think we would be up for that challenge. Yes, yes, the, me the menus should be just what we'd see at a restaurant. We need ideas for appetizers, soups, salads, main dishes, desserts, breakfast foods, and beverages. Their ideas can be themed, like a garlic donut themed restaurant, or they can be an odd collection of items that may appeal to our tastes. 
Oh, indeed, I could really go for a garlic donut about now. But please, please, for the love of turnips, include mouth-watering descriptions of what the dishes look, smell, and taste like. I want to know what it will sound like as I am chewing this dish, how it will feel as I am biting it. Please try to have the writers illustrate their menus. We'd like to know what the dish could look like if, to decide if we want to eat it. Um, all right, I, we're on it, Blotches. Hi, my name is Taryn. I am a kid and I am a helper. One of the best ways we could be helpers is by being kind and caring neighbors to the people we meet. Hi. Kids can be helpers in many ways. We could speak up if somebody is being treated unfairly. When other families are in need, we can help each other by donating toys, food, or clothes. Another way kids can be helpers is by making thoughtful notes. Cards are a caring way to tell someone you are thinking about them. These cards can say, get well, thank you, and anything else you can think of. With the help of caring grown-ups in our lives, we can also help by volunteering. Volunteering is giving your time and help to a person or organization. There are many ways to volunteer. Kids can pick up trash in the park or sort food at a food bank. Every neighborhood has special ways kids can help. How will you be a helper? Grown-up helpers are all around our neighborhood. They are doctors, police officers, teachers, 911 operators, firefighters, line workers, meteorologists, paramedics, and so many more. These helpers make our neighborhood better every day. When you grow up, you might even choose to become one of these important helpers. To meet other helpers in our neighborhood, go to meetthehelpers.org. Meet the Helpers is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Gifts of the River Project talks about the Chippewa River that runs through the town of Mount Pleasant. The idea for Gifts of the River is it's a created uh, entity that lives online but also in real life. And it's an important piece because it's a project that engages community, both um, of the Anishinaabe people who are local, as well as people at Central Michigan University, as well as people in the town of Mount Pleasant. I feel like curating community and providing inspiration for the community is really important in the work that I do. The Indigenous voice in Gifts for the River is extremely, extremely crucial. In our language, we talk about water and the earth. It's something that's living. It's another part of our family. Giving the gift to the water is really important and incorporates all the teachings of the Anishinaabe people. Hey mathematicians! In today's math challenge with our friend Diane, we'll become mathematical detectives in order to find what happens to the place value of digits when you multiply by a power of 10. Wait, what's a power of 10? Well, I guess I'll have to watch with you to find out. Hey everyone! Diane here. Welcome back. Today, we're going to be talking more about the pattern of multiplying by 10. More specifically, we're going to do some detective work about what happens to the place values of digits within a number when we multiply by a power of 10. Oh, but what is a power of 10? That is an amazing question. A power of 10 is the resulting quantity when 10 is multiplied by itself. So 100 is a power of 10 because we multiplied 10 
times 10 to get 100. It uses two tens multiplicatively. Don't you just love that word? Multiplicatively. Anyway, what we really want to notice is the pattern that is created when we multiply by different powers of 10. You may be familiar with using base 10 blocks to look at place value. What I want you to do, if you can, is stand up where you are and pretend you're on a place value chart like I have right here. We are going to move like we are the, are the digits. Ready for the first problem to explore? Let's go. Our first problem is three times 10. Think about what the product would be for that. Some of you may know it already. What is it? Right, 30. So we began in the ones place to represent the three units of one. When we multiplied by 10, we got three units of 10 or 30. So the three digit shifted to the tens place. Can you think of why? Exactly right, because 30 is the same value as three tens. Now let's move like we are this three digit and we're going to show what happens when we multiply three times 10. So get up on your feet and hop with me or a nice sidestep, whatever works for you. So we started with a three in the ones place. When we multiplied three times 10, the digit shifted over to the tens place. So let's hop. Now let's see what happens if we do that with three times 100. So slide back down to the ones place and let's think about what is the product of three times 100. Can you share that with me? Mm. I heard someone say 300 and I heard someone else say three 100s. Those are both great ways to share the product of three times 100. We know it's 300 because another way to say three times 100 is three groups of 100. So I have 100, 200, 300. So now the question is, how should we shift? Definitely needs to be to the hundreds, but how do we get there? Exactly. We shift two places to the left from the ones place, and that will get us to the hundredths place. So now, hop with me to the hundreds. Oh, that's interesting. So when we multiplied by 10, we shifted one place, and when we multiplied by 100, we shifted two places. I wonder how that could be. Maybe it has something to do with the powers of 10. Let's see if it holds true for another one. Let's find the product of eight times 100. Remember, hop back down to the ones place and become the eight digit. We know that eight times 100 equals 800. So what happened to the eight digit? Right, it shifted two places to the left. One, two. We moved two places again. Goodness, I feel like there must be a reason that we shifted two times when we multiplied by 100. What do you know about 100? Ah, oh, I heard someone say something really interesting. They said, one thing that I know is that 10 times 10 equals 100. That could have something to do with it. Let's try something and see what happens. So I know five times 100 equals 500. But what if I said, what is five times 10 times 10? Did you say and do five times 10 equals 50, and then 50 times 10 equals 500? Good thinking. In both of these examples, we shifted two times. I think we found a link between tens and digit shifting, but I wonder what would happen if we multiplied a two digit number. Let's try 15 times 100. See what happens to the digits. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. it's a little tricky, but I got 1,500. Let's do some shifting and see if the same thing happened. 
So how are the digits shifting? Let's start at looking at it piece by piece. So the five digit started off in the ones place. And with our answer of 1,500, where did it end up? Will you whisper it to me? Ah yes, it is in the hundreds place now. But what about the one that started in the tens place? Where did it end up? For sure, it ended up in the thousands place. So let's hop now and see what happens. So I'm starting as the one and I'm going to go to the thousands. So one, two. So the digits shifted two places to the left again. Isn't it interesting that even with the larger numbers, the digit shifting was still true? With powers of 10 and using our wonderful minds, we have seen a pattern to make it easier to solve different problems that have us multiplying by a power of 10. The number of tens multiplied together helps us know how many times a digit will shift. So when we multiplied a number by 100, the digit shifted two times because 10 times 10 equals 100. Two tens multiplied together. I wonder what would happen if we multiplied by 1,000. Thanks for being with me. See y'all. State University, it's right in the heart of Midtown, um, and I want to tell you about my work. I concentrate in telling the narratives of the subjects that I decide to portray and telling their, their history um, throughout the piece. So it's not just about the portrait, it's about the narrative. Um, and I use a lot of different uh, medias. Um, they're oil paintings, but then in the background there's a lot of different um, elements that I incorporate. Uh, there's artifacts, there's collage, there's um, different mediums of paint um, that I use as well in the background. I've been involved in any sort of performing arts or fine arts. I uh, went to a fine and performing arts uh, middle school, elementary school in the city of Academy of Performing Fine Arts. And it wasn't until college I uh, really focused on painting. Um, I haven't been in the orchestras and haven't done like set design and um, dance and theater and all these different things. Um, just sort of built my like, foundation um, as an artist um, and why I don't try to stick to like one particular um, thing when I, when I decide to paint my paintings, they are, um, you know, I don't want to be, keep myself in a box. And so that whole upbringing sort of like uh, define uh, like me and my personality and uh, my personality and my work. For me, growing up, there wasn't a lot of um, things accessible and like um, like programs and stuff. Um, but you just gotta like go out and seek and search for them if you wanted something. And so my idea is to like you know make something easily approachable, easily like easily seen. And so I do a lot of public stuff. Um, um, as well, and that whole idea to have like the whole community um, 
sort of interact with my work and I like experience my work um, and also like learn something about the subject as well um, that it makes stuff like easily uh, approachable like taking a hard subject like taking really really still like dull um, subjects like um, like Abe Lincoln, for example, um, the only pictures you'd find of him, uh, like black and white photo, and it has no personality. So my idea was to like give that person life and give them personality. This is one of the, the graffiti um, cutouts that I am creating with um, a glaze. Um, it's actually his name, Kobe Bryant, and I'm gonna um, mount them onto the velvet platform. So let's watch that um, process. And I'm gonna add the color. With my tool of choice, this spray paint. I'm gonna make this as colorful as possible so it stands out against the dark purple background. I make art because I have to. It's something that I've always um, you know, been drawn to. I've always painted. I've always like done something creative. Um, and then my unique way of uh, telling history and telling narratives through my portraits, I found uh, it was very important to have really like the young people and you know people of all sort of demographics like um, talk about like this one subject that. Um, pulls you in by either color or like the movement or something like just makes it interesting. Here I have the finished um, product. Welcome to Impact at Home, where we practice interrupting prolonged sitting with activity. I am Melanie Rapelli, and this is my friend Charlotte, and we are here to help you get moving for the next eight minutes. You'll be surprised at what these moments of movement can do for you and for the rest of your family so you can stay active and healthy at home. So go ahead, get up, and let's start moving. For this movement activity, we will be doing fitness drumming. All you need is a couple drumsticks, or you can use some spoons, preferably with a long handle, and if they are plastic or wooden, that would be great. And maybe check with your parents first to make sure in case they happen to accidentally break. Otherwise, follow along with us the best you can, and we will get started. We are starting with high knees. Ready? Three, two, one, here we go. Knees up as high as you can. And butt kicks. Let's go ahead and switch to jumping jacks. Here we go. That is too hard, you can always step. Get ready for squat jumps. Three, two, one, here we go. go. Or just squat and tap. One, two, 
one side. Lean, lunge. Nice work, keep it up, keep moving. All right, go ahead and march it out. Let's take a rest. Loosen up, shake it out. Get ready. We are gonna start again in three, two, one. Here we go. High knees. One foot. And the other foot. Nice work. All right, we're going to add a spin with both feet though. Ready, here we go. Jump, 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 tap, jump, 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 tap. Keep going. If you get too dizzy, you can stop, that's okay. One more time. And butt kicks. All right, we're going to do some lunge taps. One side, right leg first. Ready? Here we go. Lunge, try to get your back knee down. Don't let your front knee pass your toes. Feel the burn in your legs. Keep it up, nice job. And we're switching to the other leg. Here we go. Woo, feel the burn, you got it, keep it up. Job. Bring it to the middle. All right, go ahead and march it out. Take a rest. Shake it out. Shake out your legs. Arm swings. All right, get ready. In three, two, one. Here we go. Start in the middle just with some taps. All right, we're going to pick it up a little bit. Here we go. Nice job. Or you can slow it down, stay back on your heels. All right, switching back to jumping jacks. Ready, here we go. Nice work. You can always step it out, remember? Nice job. And butt kicks. One foot. And the other foot. Nice work, keeping your heart rate up. Let's go ahead and add a spin. One, two, ready, go. Jump, 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 tap, jump, 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 tap again. One more time. Shaman jacks. All right, shake it out. All right, we're gonna bring it down to the floor and switch to some abs. Follow along, try to keep your feet up as long as you can. You ready? All right, here we go. Three, two, one, go. Starting with mason twist. Work. Switching to X's. Nice job. Keep your feet up as long as you can. If you have to put them down, that's okay. And switching to one hand. Nice work. Ready for tuck-ins. Here we go. And ready, under the leg, left leg, right leg, left leg, right leg. Nice job.
and mason twist. All right, let's go ahead and bring it up. And let's take it out. Nice job, we're reaching for our toes. Stretch it out. Make sure you get some stretching it at home, otherwise that is all we have for you guys. Nice job. I hope you enjoyed today's movement break. Impact at Home is a chance to apply the skills you may have learned in your PE class to improve your health. To learn more about the health benefits associated with daily movement, visit impactathome.umich.edu. Now don't forget to fill out your daily log. We will see you again during our next workout. Support for this program is provided by the Michigan Public Health Institute and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Reporters inform the public about news and events happening internationally, nationally, and locally. Reporters work in various locations depending on where they set up for an interview. It could be inside a studio, someone's home, or the outdoors. Most employers prefer reporters to have a bachelor's degree in journalism or communications. Reporters research topics and stories that an editor or news director has assigned to them, write articles for newspapers, blogs, or magazines, and write scripts to be read on television or radio, and interview people who have information, analysis, or opinions about a story or article. Reporters need to have communication skills, computer skills, and persistency. Being a reporter is rewarding in so many ways. I won an Emmy Award in 2009 for my part in the coverage of the presidential election in 2008. Um, during the campaign, I was able to cover several of uh, events of Barack Obama's campaign. And then on election night, I was live in Harlem on 125th Street. Careers in journalism give you the opportunity to make a difference. Whether it's on camera or behind the scenes, you are working to deliver information. The important thing to remember about journalism is that it's reflecting the community. It's very difficult to reflect a community if the only people in journalism are men. You just have to be curious about everything. You have to be able to read about it. You have to be able to ask questions about it. You have to be able to write about it. You have to be able to tell somebody in a coherent way, this is what happened and this is why it's important. Good reporters and good reporting is about the facts. And once you present the facts to the viewer, it is the viewer's job to determine what to do with that information. So if in some way I help make your life safer, I help you make a decision that maybe you were waffling on, then I feel like I've done something positive. Someone has to help record what life was like when we lived on this planet. That's what reporters help do. I am a news anchor and I have been a news reporter and in this field of work for 24 years and it's been a great career. I like having access to information and I enjoy sharing that information and that's primarily what reporters do. We chronicle the events of the day. We get all the facts and all the information and then we run and tell everyone else. This is what happened and this is why it's important and this is why you need to. I think in the beginning it was about the information. It was about being a part of the news at that moment because growing up, that's what we watched, the news. It was almost date TV for my family. And I was fascinated by the people who had the information. And I wondered, how do they get that? And how can I be part of that? But I was also infatuated a little bit with that part that I thought was glamorous. You know, their hair was always done and they always had a makeup and their clothes were great. And then I realized that many times by the time they showed up on TV, they had waded through a field of mud to get the information. So while I might have seen them from waist up, their feet were muddy, their shoes were muddy, their, sh their pants were muddy, their jeans, their skirt, who knows where they had been. It probably smelled like smoke if they covered a fire that day. I didn't know all that because TV is still part performance. And so you never see all the sweat and all the ugly stuff that's part of the performance, but it's some ugly stuff to it. I did not know that, but 24 years into it, I'm very familiar with the ugly part too, because a lot of times you do smell like smoke. 
thank goodness nobody can smell you. They can only see you. And as long as your hair is in place and your makeup is done, they don't know about that. And that's part of the newscast. I started my broadcast career in Little Rock. And from Little Rock, I moved to Kansas City. From Kansas City to Detroit. From Detroit to Atlanta. And now back to Missouri and St. Louis. TV markets are divided into numbers. And, and there are approximately 200 or so. And uh, they're based on the size of the city served by the TV station. So New York is the fr number one market. And I don't know the smallest market, but Jonesboro is one of the smallest, which is where I started. So I was making uh, progress. Started in Jonesboro, went to Little Rock, then to Kansas City, which was at the time maybe market 30 or so. And my goal was to be in a top 10 market by the time I was 30. So I applied for a job. By then I had an agent actually. So my agent did the searching. So uh, Peter Goldberg of NS Beanstalk in New York landed me a job in Detroit anchoring the mornings. So I moved to Detroit and I worked there for three years and I worked with some amazing people. We had a great morning team and morning TV is fun because it's a very intimate relationship with the audience. They're up in the morning getting ready to go to work, having breakfast in curlers or whatever. And uh, you come into their homes and because it's more laid back, I think you're allowed to be more of yourself. It's a more energetic uh, interaction. So I loved that, but I wasn't crazy about the cold weather in Detroit. And I thought if I could just warm up, I would be happy. So Peter landed a job for me in Atlanta and I worked at WSB for two years. And then I worked briefly at CNN, maybe three, four months as a freelancer because my dad had been diagnosed with an illness and my brother was moving to St. Louis or traveling to St. Louis to do an executive MBA program. And I thought, I'd love to spend time with my brother and I need to see about my dad. I want to be closer to Arkansas. So I took the job here. I thought it would be great to welcome these young trauma nurses with some special Hawaiian lei. And I saw this army uh, nurse come walking up the path. And I said, here, this is a special gift from me to you. And she put her head down so I could put the lei over her shoulder. She noticed the button that I was wearing on my chest. Then she just put her finger on it. And she said, I know him. I said, how do you know him? He was my son. And she said, I was the trauma nurse at the crash unit where he died. And she said, I will never forget that face. <laughs> Both of us kind of looked at each other and we started crying and I gave her a big hug. But I could sense that something was bothering her. And I thought she may have sensed that my family might have been disappointed at the fact that our son, his life could not have been saved. And I said, I want you to know that my son was a warrior. He absolutely recognized all of the risks that were involved. She cried and she said that as the head trauma nurse, one of her tasks was to prepare his body for his men to have a last feeling. And she said that she tried to close his eyes, but as she went to press his lids together, they always would come open just a little bit. And she said that had bothered her all this time. And I, I looked at her and I laughed and she kind of gave me this puzzled look and she was like, I'm curious now, why are you laughing? And I said, my son would sleep with his eyes partially open. His men, when they were in combat, they were never certain what they could do when the lieutenant was sleeping because they never knew if he was sleeping or he was just awake watching what they were doing. And I said, the simple fact that you shared that story with me totally convinces me now that you are with my son. 
at, at the end. Now, I never have to wonder about those last final moments. Friends, do you know where I love visiting? Chicago. As a Midwesterner, but a city girl at heart, I love walking around the busy, beautiful streets and looking up at that gorgeous skyline. Where's your favorite place to visit? Well, if you said Detroit, Michigan, you're in luck. Today we're visiting Detroit together to meet artist Rochelle Baker. I would describe my art to others as a visual language to explain music, magic, and emotions inside of my mind. I first knew that I wanted to be an artist when I was maybe about three or four, and I started drawing and I really liked creating characters and worlds and you know drawing my favorite characters um, making new f friends or on paper or in coloring books or on my homework and I started making little stories and kind of fan comics like maybe in second grade I just remember making an entire like comic book in a class about Frog and Toad, the book Frog and Toad with a little uh, frog and toad <laughs> that hang out together and that was kind of where I realized that I really liked putting together stories, coming up with things on my own. I make art for two reasons. One, because it physically hurts me not to make art um, and it's really hard to get my feelings out or like without, without creating something. Um, and also to be able to inspire other people to make art, young or old. Um, I just want people to feel the urge to create when they look at my art or feel the urge to, you know, make something with someone else, you know, make, paint what they see, sculpt, do anything. Um, I feel like it's really important that people create. My favorite piece of work at the DIA would probably be hmm that's so tough there's so many good pieces there I think it would be Martha and Mary Magdalene by uh, Caravaggio I used to skip class to <laughs> to go to the DIA and just sit there and look at that painting it's so dramatic it's uh, there's so many little secret details that you can see if you really look close at it i really love that about Caravaggio. i love that he used drama and suspense in all of his paintings and also had an eye for like beautiful shadows and beautiful tiny details that you know you really have to take a really long look at the painting to really get every you know, f stroke in the fingers or how fabric sits on top of the subjects. And I really like that 
he puts you right there at the moment in the scene and makes it feel like you're right there. I'm currently unable to go to any print studios, which was my plan for this year, is to spend as much time uh, doing more printmaking than digital art, which is what I've been doing a lot lately. So I'm going to show um, the closest thing that I can do, which would be uh, to do painting. So I'm going to do a little um, demo about how I'm setting up my painting before I go straight into it. this piece I'm painting my friend China for a series that I started to kind of get back into doing more traditional work especially with painting and printmaking. Uh, I'm doing this piece on Procreate as kind of a map and like a setup for the actual painting so what I'm doing is I'm kind of going at it in the same way that I would would for a screen print so I'm kind of keeping at all the different colors the different patterns and all the different line work on separate layers. That way when I go to kind of set up my canvas for the actual painting, everything will kind of be separated, it'll be easy to know where everything goes, and it'll make it a little bit neater so that when I go in to do all of my fine details, all of my flats and my patterns and everything will already be there and I can just kind of like fine tune everything. So all of my little layers, all the pattern on the caftan, um, all the line work within there, all of, the, all of the details in her face, the plant and everything are on separate layers which you can do in Procreate and kind of give it more of a, a painterly or printerly look and when I'm ready to take everything off I'm just kind of going to have my iPad there at, and have the, the illustration open to just kind of give me a guideline of how everything will be set up on the actual painting. If I can help kind of inspire someone to just go out and make something and do something, that, then I've done my job. My name is Julie Broughton and I am a helper. I am very proud of my job because I get to keep you informed about the weather. I am a meteorologist. You may see me or one of my friends on TV when an emergency happens. I am going to tell you a little bit more about how meteorologists like me help. Meteorologists forecast the weather, which means we use data and our science education to help us predict what the weather will be like in the future. I work in a TV studio and use technology and scientific equipment to understand and communicate the weather to everyone in our neighborhood. I use many tools to help me predict the weather and help you prepare if there is an emergency. My computer lets me access data from radar stations around the country and satellites in space about things like rain, the rotation of clouds, and wind strength. The data I access on the computer comes in many different forms and can be numbers like the temperature outside or images of the earth. My map helps me show pictures of the weather. I can show you our neighborhood and point out the areas we might see rain during the day or where lightning has been spotted. I can even change the map to show you pictures like the weather forecast for the week. The television camera is also an important tool that helps me share the weather news with you. The camera records my forecast so you can see me on the TV in your house. My weather forecast can help you decide what clothes you should wear to protect yourself when you go outside today. Is it going to be hot? Maybe you should wear shorts. Is it going to be a cold day? Don't forget your jacket. Or maybe it will rain later and you should take an umbrella with you. I like my job because I get to help people like you. In emergencies, meteorologists can help you prepare and make sure you stay safe. When bad weather happens, meteorologists like me use science to understand how weather will impact our neighborhood. I can also share instructions on how to prepare for bad weather and give you tips for staying safe. 
During a storm, I keep everyone updated with new information about the weather. I can also help you after a storm by telling you what happened and how to stay safe if there's damage or debris on the ground. I also like to share ideas about how you can help others after the storm, like where to donate clothes or food. I am here to help you during all kinds of weather emergencies, and it is my job to help you plan for bad weather. I will do my best to make sure you and the grown-ups in your life have all the information you need to protect yourself during a weather emergency. So what's my job? To keep you safe. What's your job? To be safe. To meet other helpers in our neighborhood, go to meetthehelpers.org. Meet the Helpers is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. It's the end of our adventure, friends. I learned so much about the people who live along the Chippewa River, and it was so cool to see the art our friend Desiree makes using different materials. If you could travel anywhere in the United States, where would you go? See you next time. Thanks for having me. On the next episode of Extra Credit, we visit a cave that's over five million years old, Plus, we meet some of our country's unsung heroes. Get your extra credit on the Michigan Learning Channel. This program is made possible in part by Michigan Department of Education, the State of Michigan, and by viewers like you.